reading in all these places, uh, you know, all these verses on the building of the house of the Lord. We've been using this example, the house of the Lord, to cover a number of different subjects. And I'm hoping that tonight as we just go through this a little bit more, um, you'll be able to piece together some of the, uh, the thoughts that we've used in the past as we've been building on a lot of things, a lot of things connecting together. And right in the middle of this series, we kind of started venturing into um, the concept of headship and uh, the roles of fathers and husbands and looking at families and family life and home life. And that was not uh, a mistake. That wasn't an accidental exit. It's been kind of um, before me, even on some of these other series that we've ministered on over the last year and a half. It's a lot of things that we've been addressing um, in this ser- series that we've uh, been thinking about a lot in our hearts that God had been dealing with us on. So I'm very happy to come into these areas. And then uh, this subject of the house, Lord, is just so vast. There's so many different ways that you could explore these things that uh, you, may, you might even yourselves just see some tempting areas to go into and things to look at. And I've enjoyed the fellowship that I've had with each of you on this. But I want to continue on this thought of laying a good foundation and using that word foundation even to look at a founding, the beginning of something, when it starts. And I know that we look at things, we say a foundation and a, a house that has a foundation or a building that has a foundation, that would be some, uh, some st- uh, under, uh, understructure that you could touch, you could feel. But a foundation can even speak to how something starts, the way that it starts, its timing, the manner in which it begins. And so it, it, we're looking at how something is established, how something is set forth. And also uh, using that solid base of a structure to be an example to us of the beginnings and of the things that we do as Christians. And as we were going through it on Sunday, we could see in just a number of different scriptures. And tonight we'll draw from the message in just a couple places and see just how much the word demonstrates the importance of a foundation. Whether it be the physical structure, that solid base of a structure, or even the beginnings of something, or the th- very things that support something and guide something, we know that foundations are significant just by how God treats it in the Scripture. We use Psalms 104, verse 5 on Sunday. It speaks of God, that uh, the Lord, as it speaks in verse 1, uh, O Lord my God, Thou art very great, is what He declares in verse 1. This great God who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. His, uh, he has established it by his power and in establishing it by its, his power upon these foundations, it cannot be removed. I may be shaken, but it can't be removed. And this, the creation of the earth is compared in this way to building a building. And how that you'd begin with the foundation. It's got to start off on a solid foundation that it can remain and not be carried away or destroyed. He says, God laid the foundations of the earth. And look at all those times in Scripture that God talks about the foundations. The Scriptures talk about the foundations of the earth. And it's the, His foundation that He builds for the earth. That's why the earth won't be removed forever. It's because He put it on a solid basis, His Word. But His foundation manifests His wisdom and power. That God just didn't create, but in the way that God created, He was uh, even evolutionary and he, and he built and He raised up and He set it upon certain foundations and He supported it with certain laws. And this was also that His creation would exist and subsist and continue on. We, cont- we concluded our service on Sunday with these verses here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17, 18, and 19. Now, I'm not sure if Brother Andrew did such a tremendous job that you all forgot Everything that I had said that morning, if so, that's all right. Uh, My part was archived, his wasn't. And you can always go back and catch it uh, later just to be refreshed. But in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19, it says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. Now, he's admonishing a certain kind of attitude and a certain kind of action. So it's the attitude, it's the activity. These are things that he's addressing and admonishing. And I want you to take from that that Paul is saying, do this, think this way, uh, have this attitude and, and, and think about these things. And notice what he comes to, that you would trust in a living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And then this is part of the activity that they do good, that they be rich in good, rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So this, this attitude and activity that he's encouraging in the believer is for this reason that they can lay up and store for themselves a good foundation 
And he says, against the time to come. In other words, for later. For what might happen in the future. You say, well, why should I uh, trust in a living God? And why should I do good? And these different things that's very specific and uh, precise here. We could bring in a lot of other scriptures to show that God is asking you to do these things. Not necessarily for that very moment. That it's somehow some sort of magic potion that whenever you do it, it's like, oh, wow, isn't that neat? But you're doing it because there's a future and there's things that are going to happen later on down the road. So you're doing things now that God asks you to do because God sees all things and he asks you to do something. Do it now because he sees something coming or he knows the way that we think or the way that we're bent, uh, bent a little bit. So he's like, do these things now and it'll be for you later on. When it says that you may lay a good foundation, lay a foundation for what? For the time to come. In other words, for what may happen in the future. Do, some, do things today for what may happen tomorrow. There's going to be a future. There's going to be time. As Brother Branham said, that there's going to be a future and we have a duty to train our children as if there will be a future. Think about how maybe some of us were raised in the message during the, the 70s and there was just this idea that comes 1977, we're all going to be gone. And when that didn't happen, I thought, ah, well, maybe his calendar is just a little bit different than ours and there's no building to a future because they didn't think we'd even be here. But we have, are taught in the word of God that we, we plant our potatoes and we live our lives as if we're always going to be here. And that's kind of the secret to getting out of here. When we have this idea, well, I think he's coming in the morning or he's already come or whatever it is. And we're just kind of, you know, blase. Well, we're just going to wait till this happens. We're waiting for Brother Brand to do this. Wait for that. So, well, then it's never going to happen. And, and if it does, you're going to miss it. But it, so it's like kind of this activity and this attitude of, of preparing and working and laboring because God and this is kind of what we're wanting to express oral. God is visionary. God sees the long term. So we're not just kind of twiddling our thumbs until we get to the end. We're working our way to that. If I could say it this way, knowing what's coming, you've got to do things now for that time. And so laying a good foundation for the future is what he's saying. And we were using that and a lot of the things that we talked about and building on that threshing floor and all the history, the rich history of the location of the temple to see that b the beginning of something requires great effort. Yeah. I would and maybe even suggest greater effort. Yeah. That as, a, as something is built and you get to the end, uh, uh, whether you're building a house or it's in a project, those who work on projects, there might be a lot of activity, a flurry of activity at the end. But when you look at the beginning of something, whether it be the planning and whether it be the actual laying the foundation for it, like that's when all the really the hard work is done, the thoughtfulness and the considering and the planning. That's where a lot of these things are worked out and taken into consideration. And then when you get to the end, there's just a lot of finishing that's taking place. A lot of the expense and the greatest work is in the beginning of something. So it says, do this to lay a good foundation that's useful. Suitable, commendable, admirable, genuine, approved. It's excellent in its nature and character, that good foundation, so that it's well adapted to its end, and, and, and that it's, uh, it, it's, it's suitable and can be used for its purpose. In other words, all these things that we're asked to do are a foundation for something that's coming. And if you do it, you're laying a good foundation. And this good foundation requires sacrifice. It requires work. It requires, as I said, investment and giving. That's the, kind of the image I'm wanting us all to think. And I don't mind if you start to sweat a little bit or get anxious thinking about it. Because this is, the Christian life is a rugged life. And, and though it, our souls are at rest and our hearts are at ease in Christ, uh, he's, he's called us to work. He's called us to, to work and war, to, to build and to fight. And so this, this life here is about building things and fighting the devil who's trying to stop what you're building. And so we can't, uh, we can't get lazy. And if you start to think, man, I, just, I didn't realize there was so much effort that we had to put into this. Of course. That's what's going to make the millennium so much fun is we've already put in the work. Uh, and so there's some things that uh, we've got to do now in a spiritual sense uh, because there's a time to come. Now, in 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 16, we, this scripture, I just love how it summarizes so much. It says, now all the work of Solomon was prepared. And we're looking specifically at his labor to build the house of the Lord. Now, all the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord and until it was finished. So all the works prepared in, from the foundation to the finishing. And then it says, so the house of the Lord was perfected. This is a process that brought it to its perfection. 
And the building of the house of the Lord, I'll just repeat this over and over in case you forget why we're uh, taking our time to examine these things. It's an example to us. Whether we see ourselves in a three-room house or whether we see that our bodies are a temple, our home should be a temple, the, this church is the house of the Lord, the, all those different types and examples. Because the house of the Lord is an example to us, we want to draw from even the construction of the house of the Lord and Solomon's planning it to see something about ourselves. And the foundation of the temple and even the foundation of the earth, as we've looked at those things, they share similar descriptions and how solid they are and how they can't be removed and how permanent they were. And it says, all the work of Solomon was prepared. Now, if you turn to 1 Kings chapter 5, I'd like to read uh, verses 1 to 12. This is part of that lengthy reading. And when I do this, uh, those of you who listen for it, you can, you can listen for my lisp and get all giddy when I hit it. Uh, but this is, uh, this, is, this is Solomon's work. And I'm wanting to see all this work was prepared. And it has this picture of saying it was well ordered. That he knew what he was doing. Uh, he did it with wisdom. He did it with foresight. So let's look at the details and just think maybe in bigger picture. Not so much the foundation right now, but bigger picture. All the things that are happening even before Maybe one thing looks like it's happening on site. Everything is helping, happening in preparation for what is going to happen. And look at this wisdom, this well-ordering and this foresight that Solomon has. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon went to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David, my father, could not build a house unto the name of the Lord his God. For the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. And behold, I purpose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build a house unto thy name. So this is Solomon in response to Hiram's, you know, uh, congratulations and this affinity that he had to the family. And and he's sending him uh, this uh, greetings from his servants. He's saying, now that I've come to this, this is the prophecy that was given and I've purposed in my heart to build. So he says, now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon and my servants shall be with thy servants and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there's not among us any that can skill to hew timber like under the Sidonians. And so this is him realizing we're going to need these things. You've got it. Could you help us edit and I'll provide for you. And it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which hath given unto David a wise son over this great people. So there's something about Solomon's preparation and and his foresight in this building to say, you know what, we've been tasked to build a house, but maybe we don't have all the resources and skills that we need to accomplish this. And he's willing to ask for help and to get the things he needs and pays for him. So he says, I see this wisdom and Hiram sent to Solomon saying, I've considered the things which thou sentest to me for, and I will do all thy desire concerning the timber of cedar and concerning the timber of fir. Now, I know that when we read this, it reads as a story in a way that it's conveying enough information for us to recognize that even if it's politics and these communications, but there must have been more that Solomon provided, more that Solomon said that this king is now saying, oh, these are the plans. This is what you're doing. And now he's thought out how he's going to get all these materials to him because he says, my servant shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea and I will convey them by sea and floats into the place that thou shalt appoint me and I will cause them to be discharged there and thou shalt receive them and thou shalt accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. There's, I think there's almost enough elements here for a contract. There offer, acceptance, essential terms, a meeting of the minds. You're, I'm going to give you timber. Uh, I'm, it's going to be cedar. It's going to be fir. This is the way I'm going to deliver it. And you're going to pay me for it. This is where it's going to be. Uh, all these things are being thought out beforehand. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household and 20 measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. So it wasn't just a one-time thing. This was, some, this was something that's going to take some time to finish. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him. 
And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they made a league together. This wisdom that is spoken of here is part of how that Solomon, all that was prepared, that Solomon prepared the work. This is the work of Solomon. If I could say, go hearken back to that scripture. This is the work of Solomon that was prepared. And part of that work was in working together with this neighboring king and kingdom and saying, we have need. This is what we want to do. And he used wisdom in having peace. He used wisdom in taking advantage of those relationships. And this wisdom that God gave Solomon, he used to acquire and to pay for and to achieve the timber that was going to be needed in the temple. Temple of cedar, uh, this, the, the timber of cedar and defer. He was able to get these things that he needed because of his wisdom that God had promised him. And as you can see, even in 1 Kings chapter 5, just all the, even in these few verses we've read, the details that go into building this great temple. It says all the work of Solomon was prepared. It also speaks that it was carefully considered and accounted for beforehand. It was well ordered and it had showed wisdom and foresight. And it was prepared means that all the materials were acquired Anything that was necessary was fabricated beforehand. It was, it was procured. It was furnished and completed beforehand so that they knew they had everything necessary to finish the building before they even started. And to do this, that, that would take a lot of effort in the beginning. Not only would you have to understand what you're building and understand the work and understand what was required and even the engineering, you'd have to know this is what we're building. This is how big it's going to be built. This is how much is required to do this, how much is required to do that. And it would take considerable, uh, uh, I, I would even say manpower and wisdom and understanding to be able to acquire and accumulate all the resources you need so you can say it's all there. We've got the land. We've got the manpower. We've got all the tools and building materials we need. We can finish this structure, God allowing. God's will and God's time will never lack for provision. And so they knew God's will. They knew it was God's time and they saw the provision. So like, let's go to work. Let's build this. And if God would show us grace, we have enough to complete it. Maybe it could have been instructive to them if you're like, well, we don't have everything we need. Then it's not time to build. We don't have everything. It's not time to build. There's a, a piece that I have as a pastor. I think there's a piece that maybe the trustees have that if there's a point at which we feel like these facilities aren't going to be uh, uh, big enough for our church, that God's going to provide and that the resources will be there in the time that we need it. And if, if the resources aren't there right now, I've got this piece and just believe in that it will be if the, if the opportunity comes, God will provide because God's will and his time will never lack for provision. So to be well prepared, it's to look and have foresight beforehand. This is something that's been part of the, the language I've been using maybe for the last few services, uh, this foresight, this discernment, the watchman who sees things. I'm wanting to draw on that and speak to the hearts of the parents and the elders that there ought to be some sort of wisdom and understanding that we've acquired in our experiences with God that prepare us for this moment right now for those who are going to be facing the things that we're going to see in the future. Uh, those of us who've been through courtships and we've gotten married and we started to have kids and we've tried to make, make ends meet and we've made decisions to move and whatever it might be, we've been there. So we realize now I can teach something to my children so that they can have the benefit of the wisdom that I've been given by God and hopefully make their path a little bit better. I, I would find no greater joy than to see my children far exceed me at any juncture in their life than where I was. If my children drive better cars, if they get better grades, have a better education, if they preach better sermons, whatever it might be, if they start a church just within the five miles from here and it's a better church and the word is pure and the people are pure, I would be happy to see that whatever labor we had propelled them and was a foundation for them to far exceed what I was able to do as a parent. I can't think of a greater compliment than to see your children outdo you. And I, I say that humbled by my children's daily efforts to outdo me <laughs> in everything. Amen. Now, in Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 30, I think we've read this recently, and I, I keep finding myself looking at this scripture over and over again, like, man, there's just so much to say here. But then it's like, he says it all in the verses. And it's not like a lot of commentary you can give to it, but it's not going to stop me from trying. For which of you intending to build a tower... Sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. This is a question that is rhetorical in nature 
assuming that nobody is going to start building something without first knowing they have everything they need to build it. Otherwise, they're going to start, verse 29, less happily after he had laid the foundation and he's not able to finish it. In other words, you can say, oh, well, I've got X number of dollars here and I've got this much material. So then you lay the foundation. You didn't realize just how much work went into the foundation, just how much can be poured into the cost of the slab, just how much goes into the lumber. And you get the, you get the shell, you get the beginning, but then you don't have enough to finish it. So he's actually kind of making the point that real wisdom before anything is undertaken slows down and says, do I have sufficient, not just to lay the foundation, but to finish the superstructure and have it all finished? He says, otherwise, people will begin to mock him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish it. He was he wanted to build and he had some things to work with and he started and he laid did this good and he did that good and he had everything, but he lacked planning. He lacked that discernment, that visionary aspect, that foresight or that planning, the preparation. In other words, Solomon went to build the temple. Jesus is referring to man to build the tower. And in the same way that Solomon built the temple. And think of that. The greatest thing we could think of, maybe by way of physical structure, the very identity of the Jews, the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple mount, the very center of creation, the very dwelling place of God. The way in which Solomon approached building the temple is the same way you would approach building a simple tower. You would think about it beforehand. You say, well, what does it take? I want to build a tower, but I don't want it to be on wheels. I want to be able to have it the permanent location. And this is what's going to take for the foundation. And this is what you're going to need for the superstructure. I would, even, I would even argue that this is pretty good instruction for those who like to use Legos and Playmobil or building blocks, whatever it might be. I mean, sit down and consider. Do, I, this is what I want to build in my mind. Do I have sufficient to finish, to build? Can I, can I see in my, my vision of what I want to build? Can I see where, what kind of materials are going to be used in this and know that I have sufficient to finish it? Right. And let me just remind you, you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. Amen. Now consider, and so it says in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, and the house, when it was building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. Uh, this, that's my, a mind-blowing scripture. And uh, too bad they can't figure this out for all the building projects that take place in our subdivisions. Like, you know, can't they just get this all done ahead of time so I don't have to hear the beeping and the hammering and the drilling? But they were actually able to fashion the pieces that were needed and of these stone and even it's the timber and those things as you read in other places and actually uh, this is maybe a good point to say this there's so many in uh, different places that some of these things are mentioned in scripture that so a volume of things you could read in and the kings and chronicles and different places to see even in the psalms it's a lot that you can gather from to, about the building of the temple in the house of the lord but it's saying the stone was made ready there was not a hammer or an axe or a tool heard in the house while it was building. It was all done beforehand. And they didn't just go build a brick, bring it, lay it down and go, OK, let's build another one like this. Go build it and bring it. It was as if they knew already what it was going to look like and how it was going to fit together. And they did all the work beforehand and they were able to bring it in and silently place it brick by brick, stone by stone. This was the wisdom that Solomon exhibited in building the house of the Lord. This was the planning that was required. It wasn't, well, bless God, I want to do this and I'm just going to try. I'm just going to try and see what happens. No, there was, uh, it, there was wisdom that was exercised. So let's consider the, the vastness of this building construction. And if you want to call it a project or uh, um, an undertaking. And think of that. Again, we're talking about building the house of the Lord. So it's not just a tower. It's not just a granary. It's not, you know, an outbuilding. This is the place that God would dwell in 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 to 14, it gets more particularly, as we've already read in uh, these first 10 verses, and maybe we could just track that a little bit, how it was telling us the house of the Lord is going to be made of this length and this length, and there's going to be out rooms and things round about it. It's quite a uh, uh, campus. I think the entire thing, once it was finished, covered like 17 acres, uh, um, not just the temple building, but everything related to it. And, and as it began to build and grow there on the Temple Mount, 
these things had to be interconnected. They relied upon one another. So it was a pretty vast project. And as we're reading how they, they, they're building these chambers and there's going to be a middle chamber, it says in verse 11, And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which thou art in building. So this isn't the, in the time of its being built. It's in this process. If thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then I will perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. He was coming to that place in the building where now it's not just going to be outer court, inner court, but now it's going to be that most holy place. The house within a house within a house. The three room house, however you want to look at three houses or three rooms, those different ways that we looked at it in the very beginning of the year. It says, if you will do this thing right and you'll walk before me, this is where I'll dwell. This place you're getting ready to build, this holy of holies, this most holy place, I will come and dwell there. And it says, so Solomon built the house and finished it. In reading these, if I'm, he built a house, he built a house, he built a house, you find there's all these little houses that are all working together to make one great, beautiful thing. It's, it, it's recounted here in 2 Chronicles chapter 3. I'll read verses 5 to 17. And the greater house, this is the most holy of holies. This is that most holy place, the holiest of holies. Now just think of how this room, this house within a house, is described. And the greater house, which Solomon built and finished, the place that God said that he would dwell, he sealed with fir tree, which he overlaid with fine gold and set there on palm trees and chains. This is a wainscoting. This is wood paneling. This is finishing it out just beautifully. And he garnished the house with precious stones for beauty. And the gold was gold of Paravim. And he overlaid also the house, the beams, the posts, the walls thereof, and the doors thereof with gold and grave cherubims on the walls. And he made the most holy house, the link whereof was according to the breadth of the house, 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof, 20 cubits. And he overlaid it, so it's that perfect square, and he overlaid it with fine gold amounting to 600 talents. And the weight of the nails was 50 shekels of gold, and he overlaid the upper chambers with gold. And in the most holy house, he made two cherubims of image work and overlaid them with gold. And the wings of the cherubims were 20 cubits long. One wing of one cherub was five cubits, reaching to the wall of the house. And the other was likewise five cubits, reaching to the wing of the other cherub. Now, do you see how, it's, how much this is covering? And how even big, now, how big the room is, the square. Now these cherubims, if you start doing the math, you realize these things are touching out and reaching this whole thing and very vast. It says in verse 12, And one wing of the cherub was five cubits reaching the wall of the house. The other wing was five cubits joining to the wing of the other cherub. The wings of these cherubims spread themselves forth 20 cubits, and they stood on their feet, and their faces were inward. And he made the veil of blue and purple and crimson and fine linen, and wrought the cherubims thereon. And he made before the house two pillars, 30 and five cubits high. And the chapter that was on the top of each of them was five cubits. And he made chains as in the oracle and put them on the heads of the pillars. And he made a hundred pomegranates and put them on the chains. And he reared up the pillars before the temple, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and called the name of that on the right hand, Jashin, and that, the name of that on the left, Boaz. And in other words, it shall be established in his powers. I think what those names are referring to. And this is just some of the details of this one part of the house of the Lord. The one specific chamber or room and some of the porch associated with it. Some of the little uh, building a little bit further out. These are just some of the details of the construction. And there's more details that you could come in here and begin to read in chapter 7 uh, uh, and, and over and over again, all these different things that start to happen on this place where he's building. And it, just the breadth of the structure, the details of it, everything that's being thought out beforehand. It says in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 38, in the 11th year, in the month bull, which is the 8th month, was the house finished throughout all parts thereof, and according to the fashion of it, it's the original way it was envisioned and all the ways that it was to be done in order to be in service. Because one of the things that doesn't happen is they don't begin to offer worship in there until it's done. Until it says the house was perfected. So it was finished throughout all the parts according to the fashion of it, the use of it. What it was used for. It wasn't one of these things, and I know we do this sometimes in our natural lives where we, we, get, we get it built so far and then we move into it. Where you're able to do that. Certainly probably not anywhere around Phoenix or Maricopa County. 
But uh, if you lived out in Ohio somewhere, I, mean, I knew people who built things and lived in their garage until they could finish the rest of it. I'm not going to name names. Don't get nervous. And, and, and that was just because you could do it. And, and it was a great way to save some money. And then there's, but it's saying, we won't, we won't get our, per we're not going to move in. We're not going to do anything here until it's finished because that's the use of it. We don't want to do anything halfway. It's going to be established by his strength. He has established it. He has established it by his power. These pillars, all these details. You can go through the colors. You can go through the pomegranates, the palms, the cherubims, all these things. Pointing back to the, ta the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. Back to the image that Moses saw in heaven. How they all have some sort of representation and meaning. All these details and all these things are finished. It says, so he was seven years in building it. Of course it was seven, right? Seven years in building it, so it's completion, this perfection of it. Now, with again, I know I'm, just, I'm reading a lot of scriptures here. So let's just think about all those details, the breadth of it, the weight of it. I think, well, the foundation, the foundation of this temple. What was going to be built on it and what, would be, uh, it, what it would be supporting. You read about all this gold, all this material. All this thought going into uh, this most holy place and the porches of it. It's pretty detailed. Would you agree? From the beams to the post to the walls to the curtains to the pillars uh, to the things above the pillars. A hundred pomegranates. He puts on the chains. Just how detailed they'd have to be. And the pillars, at, at, at one on the right and left. And he gives them even names. And there's things on top, the heads of the pillars. This is a lot of detail. So this is what you see. This is the finished project. Project. In all of its grandeur, but if you don't put that thing on the right kind of foundation, these things won't last. And I would like to, again, remind you, think about our own lives. Think about our families. Think even about our church and, and the kind of vision that we might have, the goals. Well, I want to accomplish this. I want to accomplish that. There may be some here that have a vision to be something when they get older, go to school and do this. And, and it's always kind of off in the future. I want to go to college and I want to get this degree and I want to do this. Or I want to become this. I want to become that. Or I want to get married and I want to have children. I want to... All these vi visions and dreams that we have, all these ambitions, they're going to be built upon whatever you're doing right now. Your future is going to be built upon whatever it is you're doing right now. And now that might cause a pure panic in some people to think, where I'm standing right now is built on everything I've been doing for the last 49 years. <laughs> I need to get insurance. I mean, there, and that's the truth. I realize I'm the product today of things that have happened in my life and things that bring me to this moment. But I think it's nice to know that if the Lord tarries, I can start doing things now with a vision, with a heart to accomplish things for God. Say, well, then I may not be able to go to college now. I may not be able to get that dream job. But what can I do today? What can I be doing today to meet that goal later? Kind of like uh, what, what they do at University of Michigan. Go blue. They have a thing. Like, what are you doing today to beat Ohio State? Well, whatever they've been doing the last few years is working. And that's the kind of that's the way that they attack every day as football players. What are you doing today? I'm not going to wait till the game. I had to bring sports in it to wake a few people up. It's, it's not waiting until the time comes. Well, I'm a football player. Well, I'm this and I'm that. I'm a man. I'm going to be a husband. I'm, I'm going to be a father. I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to be this. What are you doing today? What are you doing today to make you, get you in a place where God could use you later? Brother Bram talks about our consecration and our surrendered life, that hidden life, so that you can find yourself, welcome back, Brother Michael, uh, you can find yourself in a place where God knows where you are when he wants to use you. So it's not so much just, well, I'm just going to wait till he wants to use me. Put yourself in position to be used. He's going to be reaching for a tool. So as a tool, get in your place. Somebody goes to find you. He's got the tool he needs to use. And this is, this is part of the idea that I'm wanting to present in the image of the foundation, laying a good foundation. What's going to be built in your lives? What is it you're dreaming of? What is it you're wanting to be used for? What is it you're going to be supporting uh, what's going to be in the future? Then that what you're doing today is supporting what's going to be in the future. So the foundation of this temple was important. As much detail as we see here in 2 Chronicles 3, as much detail in chapter 5 and chapter 6, as much detail as we can glean out of the scriptures, there, there, there's things that are said about the foundation that are so important to catch because everything else and its weight and its grandeur and its beauty is all set it on something that might not even necessarily be seen. In 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 13 to 18, we stopped at verse 12 earlier. 
And Solomon's wisdom that God had given him was being manifested in the way that he's procuring the, the cedar and the fir. It says, And King Solomon raised a levy out of all of Israel. We're going to read verse 13 to verse 18. And the levy was 30,000 men, and he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month by courses. A month they were in Lebanon and two months at home. And Adoram was over the levy. So here he's thinking, I need to send laborers. We need to, we need to have a rotation. We're going to think through this. We're going, to be, we're going to think about, well, how good would it be to send the men away for a long time and keep away from their wives and families? So let's do rotations. Let's not burn anybody out. And Solomon had three score and 10,000 that bear burdens and four score thousand hewers in the mountains. Beside the chief of Solomon's officer, which was, with officers which were over the work, 3,300, which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. A lot of details here. The labor force that's necessary. Now let's look at the foundation. And the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, and huge stones to lay the foundation of the house. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders did hew them and the stone quarries. So they prepared timber and stones to build the house. So when it came time to build the house, he wasn't just getting good wood. He wasn't just getting good gold. He wasn't just getting good materials to furnish and finish it out and fur it out and make it all look real beautiful. But he said, I want to have great stones as my foundation. They brought great stones and not just big, but costly, hewed, prepared beforehand. Just as it's prophesied of Christ, I'm going to lay a foundation stone. And for a foundation stone, it's going to be a precious stone. It's going to be a tried stone. It's going to be a sure stone. It's the same thing here. Costly, great, hued. Things were shaped beforehand, tried, shaped, carved out to be set in it. And the builders of Solomon and, and Hiram and the, the stone cores, they, they prepared the timber. They prepared the stones, as we read later, well beforehand to fit into the temple. And the description of the foundation, great, costly, cut, shaped stones. That's how our foundation has to be. Great. It's got to come with the price. It's got to come with sacrifice, shaping, a cutting down. And the sermon fellowship by redemption. I didn't provide any of the quotations tonight on slides. I apologize. Just a lack of maybe energy and time today. It says, and I'm believing that the day that we're living now, the most essential thing that I could think of any minister speaking of is to get the people back to the general principles of the gospel, coming back to a place, coming back to bedrock, to absolutes, to things that we know are sure you are built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets, the chief cornerstone being Christ himself. There's no other foundation that can be laid than Jesus Christ. He said, we've got to come back to these things. One of the most essential things that we could be preaching are the general principles of the gospel. That there could be a little bit of a temptation of saying, well, we, we want to get into the deeper things and we want to get into the, uh, the, the, the real weightier things of the message of the hour and those things. But those things are built upon the foundational things. Do you realize, listen, and I, if I say this wrong, forgive me and, and give me a decade maybe to refine the way I'm saying it. But do you realize 1963 from Seals Post to 1965 is resting upon the foundation of 47 to 63? It's not like Brother Bram just showed up and said, now turn to Revelations chapter 5. Yeah, right, like, right, right. Go ahead, Mr. Branham, whoever you are, young guy, go ahead, break, break it down for me. This, the, his entire life and his suffering and, and his testimony up to the time that they start recording sermons. We're, where are we if we just start pushing play on, on God hiding himself in simplicity? It's built upon his entire ministry and the vindication and all those things tying together so that we're not just cherry picking stories and testimonies and prayer lines. We're realizing that God laid a great foundation and did a lot to invest himself in this prophet's ministry so that when it came to these great things that he would be breaking, these great revelations, it would be built upon something else. Amen. We'd have a foundation. So Brother Abraham is saying the most essential thing is this, getting back to general principles of the gospel. In other words, you need to know your ABCs to do your algebra. For if you're not built upon the right foundation, it's just, it's no good. What's the use of building upon a foundation that's already been condemned? Now, this takes some Wisdom in our own lives to realize if we need to shape anything up and say, well, things aren't the way they should be in this home or things aren't the way they should be in my life. And we go to just start remodeling our lives, but we didn't recognize 
It was condemnation of the substructure. It was calling out the foundation. There might be some things you've built that are good, but you tried to build them on the wrong kind of foundation. She says, what's the use of building on something that's already condemned? What would be the use of trying to paper and paint an old building that the government had condemned? Paper and paint. That might amount to what a lot of people do with their lives. They try to paper and paint something that's already condemned. And that's what many people are trying to do today by reforming, trying to reform. We'll start a church. We'll turn a page. We'll try to do a little different than what we used to do. There's so many examples of this where even situations that don't quite work out, whether it be in families. Well, some people uh, recently, well, I need to be very careful what I say here. I won't even say it. Oh, you should have heard it, though. But there's things that happen. There's situations that transpire and people are upset with what is and they go and they start something new and they just replicate what they left and they set themselves up to experience the same thing again. Because they, they just tried to change the optics and put a lot of paper and paint and they didn't realize the foundation was wrong to begin with. He says that they're just trying to reform, start a new church, turn a page. We'll try to do a little different than we used to do, just a little different. You'll never get nowhere like that. It's just foolish to even try. You're just only wasting time. Hope you're hearing this. Make it applicable. What I'm reading in this sermon, Fellowship by Redemption, there were several passages in here that were just speaking so specifically to foundations. And I realized, Brother Bram is saying a lot that can be applied in a lot of different ways. And, and coming back to the gospel, the rebuke of denominations. But I'm wanting us to glean from it this general principle of foundations and beginning work and what things are resting upon. And not just trying to paper and paint the, the current optics of something, but asking myself, is it on the right kind of bedrock? Maybe you bought the paper and the paint and you're wanting to build later and you're wanting to do something later and you're early on in your life. Recognize now before you ever start applying paper and paint. What can I do now to be sure that I'm not wasting my time later? He says, foolish to even try. You're only wasting your time. You say, well, now I believe if we would just quit, if I would just quit me my lying and me lying and stealing, my lying and stealing. And all those, he says, if if I could just stop doing bad things, me interjecting there. He says, all those things, as good as they are, you're still a million miles off the road. You've got to start back to the foundation. You've got to build a new place, not patch up the old one. Build a brand new one. You've got to come back, start right. That's the reason you see so many faulty mistakes, so many people indifferent, people who profess Christianity. Now, that might sound like a really harsh rebuke, but it's actually just a beautiful correction. The reason why we see mistakes, indifference in people who profess to believe this message is because they didn't get on the right foundation. To me, in a lot of ways, you could just extrapolate this out and realize that's why a lot of people fall apart and, and their lives, they backslide or they leave or they get bitter towards the message. They, didn't, they weren't built on the right foundation. And in many cases, it's not necessarily their fault They were being taught and given things that weren't good for a foundation. Legalism, the worship of a man, uh, culture, politics, church identity, uh, uh, um, a lot of of things to build. Well, we're standing on this, we're standing on this. You just kick that chair right from out under him and their whole house of cards falls apart. And like, man, I don't have anything to do with the message. It's just theater. It's just a house of cards. It's just a bunch of hypocrisy. And they're actually right about what they experienced. And they didn't have the right kind of foundation because a lot of other people experience the same blows and they notice their house of cards fall down, but they realize they had good bedrock. They had good foundation, but they had made the mistake of building the wrong things on it. And they got down to base and they said, you know what? My identity is in this foundation. This is a revelation, not some sort of fascination. And I can't I can't change where I'm at, but I got to build differently going forward. Can't just you got to build a new place, not just patch up the old one. It speaks to us of the importance of laying a good foundation. I have to confess, I've been doing my best to preach a two-hour sermon lately, and I can't even get to an hour. And so tonight, I'm just determined. I actually just started adding stuff in later. Just asking chat GPT, here's my sermon. What would be good at the end for another 30 minutes? And it just started spitting a lot of good stuff out. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. I'm just vamping to get more time. The importance of laying a good foundation. 
it, it's so necessary. And as we've talked about the kingdom, we've talked about the future home, and we've looked a lot at the, the things in the future, a lot of those things over the last few years, we've been looking at the beginning of things and the end of things. And that's just kind of how, how we've been doing the overview. But as we even look at the, the new Jerusalem, the city of God, it, it's, it speaks to how the importance of laying a good foundation. Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, in the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So it just didn't build a wall, but had foundations for the wall. There's so much that goes into things. You, you, you may look at a straight wall and you're like, oh, I, I want a wall just like that. And you go by the stone and you go by the brick and you, and you buy everything that you see. And then, and then you begin to uh, lay them, try to lay them straight and make yourself a wall. I'm willing to bet that that wall is going to look like, talk about serpentine, right? I mean, this thing just you know, weave it in and out uh, and lean in this way, lean in that way. Because it takes, it takes a, a mason, it takes someone who knows what they're doing to, to build a wall. And one of the things that happens first is, well, what's going to be holding up all this brick? And is the ground strong? How high is it going to be? How much is it going to weigh? It, once, it, once it begins to settle, is it going to stay upright? So sometimes you may see a wall and you think, wow, okay, so they used 10 bricks and they did this and they did that. And you don't realize that they had to dig six, six feet deep, right. lay down railroad ties and every 10 feet lay a dead man in there and dig it out to hold it all together. And you never actually see any of that, but the rest of it's built on top of it. Right. And here you could see uh, uh, walls. Oh my, look at these walls. But what about their foundation? They had 12 foundations. Verse 18, in the beginning, the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. In the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Then, this is not just the garnishing. This is the foundation. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, calcony. The fourth, an emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, burl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysoporus, says, the, the eleventh, adjacent, the twelfth, and amethyst. These are, these are the actual foundations. It's not that they just kind of kind of hewed a stone and said, give me a sapphire. Dink. Isn't that nice? Got a little, no, this is God. And, and what I, I love to just imagine is how that God, when he created the heavens and the earth, like where are these materials coming from? When he did in the beginning, he laid certain things in the earth. If he laid the cornerstone in you before the foundation of the world, he's laying the very foundation of even the new, new Jerusalem when he begins to create. You were there. The city was there. The stones were there. The very wood of that tree that Christ would be crucified on, he sowed into the earth in creation and began to grow trees, knowing that one day a tree would come forth that the Savior would be hung on. The very iron that made the nails that, ham that nailed him to the cross and fastened the Son of God to a cross. As we begin to think about the, res the crucifixion and resurrection this week, God put the ore in the earth when he created it. Man didn't mix that in an in in urn. He didn't have some sort of formula in Minecraft to be able to build, you know, uh, to build nails to crucify the Messiah. God put it in there in the beginning. And each precious stone was not just an ornament but a pillar itself, the foundation itself of the walls. This is the importance of laying a good foundation. I am going to make maybe the risk polling you right now individually, but is this going all right? Hunter, am I doing, is this okay? Do you approve? Just kind of some terse lips. Told you I was taking a risk, especially asking a young guy like this. He's like, mm, sorry, bud. But it, I, I trust it's going okay for you because it's very simple. I'm just wanting you to think about what it takes to lay a foundation. You want to have a good future? What does it take to have a good foundation? What is it going to take? A, a good foundation. Yeah. Yeah. You, want to, you want your family to go the right way? Good foundation. You want your children to go in the way that they should go? Train them up in the way that they should go. Yeah. There's work that you put in in the beginning. It, it, the, this is the importance of laying a good foundation. Even in building his own house, if you want to turn to 1 Kings chapter 7, Solomon did the same thing with his own house. The palace that would just be there next to the temple. It's part of this great, big, huge complex that was being built. It's got to have foundations. It's got to have bedrock. First Kings chapter 7, verses 1 to 12. I'm not going to try to preach two hours in that. I'm just trying to at least get to an hour. It says, and all these were of costly stones. According to the measure of, the huge, of huge stones. I wanted to 
uh, read more in this. But in verse one, but Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished all of his house and he built the house of the forest of Lebanon. And he begins to describe the length of it and the windows and the doors and the posts and the porch and the pillars and the ports within. And then the house he built for Pharaoh's daughter. There's so much that's being built here. But now it says this is kind of the, the foundation. All these were costly stones according to the measures of hewed stones. Sawed with saws, within and without, even from the foundation unto the coping and so on the outside toward the great court. Everything's costly, expensive. And the foundation was of costly stones, even great stones. He's not sparing any expense in the foundation. If I could say this, if you're going to skimp, don't do it in the foundation. Don't go to build, as they say, that I think the temple's around 2,700 square feet or something like that. Can't remember just what they say about that. So they say, well, you know, we're going to have gold and gold pomegranates and gold palms and gold chains and gold this and gold that. And, and it's just going to be so rich and majestic. So we, we, since we're going to put a bunch of money in that, why don't we just kind of sweep the rock off a little bit and just clear a patch? No, it, they had to go with costly stones, great stones, stones of 10 cubits and stones of 8 cubits. And above were costly stones after the measure of huge stones and cedars. And the great court roundabout was with three rows of huge stones and a row of cedar beams, both for the inner court of the house of the Lord and for the porch of the house. And what are they all resting upon? This costly, strong foundation. Solomon laid a good foundation for the house of the Lord. Solomon laid a good foundation for his house. He laid the foundations of... Uh, very deep in the ground. He used a hard, durable stones. Uh, stones that were hewn, that could stand the pressure, could stand the test. He, in other words, I, I want to make a foundation that'll last, that'll be there. Yeah. I remember when we built a house in Texas and we had to dr drill these pillars, these footings. And I had to go like, I can't remember how many feet, over 20 feet, maybe 30 feet. And there's like 18 of them or 20 of them. And they had to drill them until they got to bedrock. And, and, and basically the engineer, when they were done, says, well, this whole area can get flooded and your house will just be standing on stilts. Because you, you put enough in it and you're like, this house isn't going anywhere. This, this is not going to settle. This is not going to shift. At least that's what we told the buyers. <laughs> no. Uh, but you use durable stones. They, they had their own inspections. <laughs> Stop the tape. <laughs> that the stones they used, this was the part that I found remarkable as I was studying this. They were to become part of the earth itself. No more the days of just a temporary tabernacle in the wilderness. But the foundation stones were to be united with the earth itself so that the structure itself was united with the earth and the base. The, 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 these pillars, these structures, upon that they became the basis, the foundation, the sure foundation for the superstructure to be built. The pillars, as Brother Brown talks about them being the support of the superstructure. And it to build, I, I'm wanting to read a statement and close. To build the foundation, you had to take into consideration the complete, the vastness of the temple itself. For Solomon to build the right foundation, he had to take into consideration what, uh, uh, to build his house, he had to take into consideration when he built the foundation for his house, he had to know what he wanted his house to look like. The temple was going to be grand, it was going to be heavy, it was going to be uh, strong, expensive, of great importance. And if it was going to house God, that's where he was going to dwell. He didn't want to cut corners. He didn't want to just build it anyway. The foundation had to be laid correctly. I'm asking you, what are you building? What is it you want to look like? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to succeed? And I'm, I, I'm wanting to challenge you with this thought of whatever you want your future to look like, then you have to give thought to what you're doing today that that, what it will be present then, is built on your past, which is now, right? And you got to know, will it fit? Will it be through 
indolence or indulgence. You just laze around and you don't do anything. You're not trying hard. You're not working. Well, the product in the end is probably going to reflect the laziness, the indulgence in things of the world, the lack of foresight, the lack of care and concern. As a family, we were listening to a sermon this past week where Brother Bam says, it's in the sermon Job, where Brother Bam talks about, and I'd like to use some of these statements maybe coming up. Brother Bam says, it's a shame that parents don't take interest in their children anymore. They're not thoughtful about the time that they're spending with other things. They're not spending time with them. They've been kind of lulled to sleep and so many things are happening not realizing. Before you know it, it gets away from you and they're gone. Like, what did I do? What, how did I, did I, did I prepare them for life? So this temple was important. So what it rests upon was very important. In the Sermon Fellowship by Redemption, Brother Branham again, he's kind of connecting on the, well, I want to stop this, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that, I'm going to go to church. And on all those things that we could try to do, that's, if I could say, is the paper and the paint. But the question is, what's it built on? He says, and these are fine, all these other things are all right, I have nothing against it, but that's still not the basis. Don't build upon that alone, intellectual faith. Come back to the basis here, get it in here. And I would say that not being present, I said that it doesn't, it can't be intellectual here. It's got to be a revelation here. The revelation is the rock. The revelation is the stone upon which you are built. It's the stone upon which the church is built. The chief cornerstone, Christ, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The new birth is the personal revelation of Jesus Christ to you. You've got to be built on that. It's something that we realize even in raising our own children. We want to teach them. We want to teach them in a way where they can have integrity and they can have character. But if they're ever going to be real, genuine Christians, they've got to have an experience themselves. He says, you want to have, have it in here to fellowship with him, to talk with him. And then build on these other things. Bring these other things under that foundation. So if you've got all of these other things there, that's great. That's fine. But really, they don't work until they come back to the foundation they're designed for. Man, think about all these things that were going to be in the temple. Pomegranates, palms made of gold, chains made of gold, all these things. All these really nice things. And if they just kind of set them up uh, uh, in some spot, just set them up on the threshing floor of Orna, if they would have had that there and be like, oh, okay, this is neat, this is great. All the same elements would not have been as functional and would have not been what God wanted. And, they could, and, and it would have been, oh, this thing's a mess. But take the same things and put them on the right foundation. Like, now that's, that's what we're looking for. I say that to, especially to those of us here on a Wednesday night. Man, I would say coming to church on a Wednesday night doesn't save you. It's not even any indication that you are saved. And, and it's not necessarily, a, a, should be a feather in your cap or something that you get puffed up about. But doing this is a good brick. This is a good brick. This is a good uh, element, a resource. This is a, a great thing in your wall. But you got to be sure that the foundation's there. So that bricks like this fit together. And Wednesday night after Wednesday night is brick by brick. Building something that will last. He says, bring these other things on the right foundation. But you're trying to bring these fundamental, fundamental truths upon a foundation that has nothing to do to it. He says, Brother Wood somewhere in the building is a contractor. Well, what good it to him to take an old building that's worm-eaten, termites have eaten the building down, and it's rotten to the foundation... And go out and get some of the best lumber that he could find. Good, dry, seasoned redwood. Tack it on the house. Go out there and get paint that's recommended by the highest paint company in the world. He said, look here, preacher. I can show you that this is the real, genuine redwood. I'd say, yes, Brother Wood. That's right. Now, can you make this personal, just this analogy he's using? How is it applicable in our own lives where we're bragging about real good redwood? We're bragging about the best kind of paint but our foundation isn't right. All the optics and pretense sometimes that we can engage in as message believers. Well, Brother Branham said it. No. Brother Branham said it right here. I can print it out for you. Well, what, what are you building all these quotes on? What's the basis? What do you want it to look like in the end? You got the best paint. You got the best redwood. You got all the best quotes. He says, he says but look here. Here's the seal of approval that this is the best paint that could ever be put on a house. That's right, Brother Wood. But your foundation is wrong. It's got to come down. Wow. You mean I can have all the best redwood, can have all the best paint, 
I can have all the best um, understandings of the message and I can have all the best quotations and scriptures and all these personal experiences and I have all these things, but if the foundation's not right, the rest of it has to come down. He said, that's what's the matter. As we read earlier, he said, that's what's the matter with faulty mistakes and indifference in people who profess Christianity. The foundation's not right. He says, your foundation's wrong. It's got to come down. Everything you've been building up. Now, let me caution this. The redwood's good. Maybe the paint job's good. He said, but you've got to bring it down. And he says, take all those things that you've built and put them on the right foundation. That's what's the matter. Reading the scripture's right. Preaching the gospel's right. But your foundation's wrong. Tear out your mental conception of things and get God in your heart by the shed into the blood and then build from there. Amen. Your wood is all right if you've got it on the right foundation. There you are. I, I, I know, as I said earlier, that the things he's saying has a very specific application in terms of even salvation and coming to the bedrock of a, 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 the shed blood of Christ, a re, washing the sinner and being born again. But it's a principle that we can apply over and over again as we go forward. Is this, is today built upon the right foundation of yesterday? And if yesterday wasn't the right foundation, do today what you should have done yesterday so that the next day you can do what you were supposed to do with the right kind of foundation. Don't try to play catch up and get it all done today. No, get on the right kind of basis today. Your wood's all right if you've got the right foundation. There you are. Just don't be angry with me now. May cut a little bit, but this is the truth. This is what helps you. Go back to the right foundation, to the fellowship. Oh, it's beautiful. I encourage you to listen to that. Fellowship by redemption. There was a number of, the, number of other places I would have liked to have read. Different examples where Brother Bam talks about a foundation. What's it, what it's built on. But let me close with this. Brothers, you could come to your instruments. In Psalms 11, verses 3 and 4. It asks this question, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. What an image to talk about the Lord in his holy temple, the throne which is in heaven. And now we see this mirror on earth, the throne room, the most holy place, the greater house, the holy temple, the outer court the inner court, the outer court. All, this, all these things, his eyes that do behold the children of men to try them. And the question is asked, if you destroy the foundations, what happens to the righteous? Again, these foundations are not just physical. It's not that all the righteous were kind of standing on a slab and if you destroyed that, where would they go? What would they do? But it's the principles upon which something is built. The laws by which something is governed. I wonder sometimes, I'll just say this to us as individuals, I wonder sometimes if we don't start removing things from the message of the hour because we don't think it's essential and because the time that we're living in and we don't realize that we're kind of shedding away the foundation. Foundations of holiness. The foundations of decency and abstaining from the things of the world. The foundation of how a man, ought to, a man ought to look and a woman ought to look. The foundation of our marriages and what they're built upon. And just seems like anymore, it's not uncommon to find this brother divorced, that sister divorced, them getting married together and, and everybody acting like, well, I mean, it's 2024. What do we do? And we're not reminding ourselves, you know what? There's a, there was a basis that we had that formed the foundation of this message and though people might find themselves in difficult situations they lose their way for a little while and things happen and I get it and I'm certainly not wanting to be condemning of any particular situation but let's not forget the bedrock upon which we're built and think that we could just kind of kick out the whole thing and be a capstone just a hovering capstone like this is some sort of magic like a, an unidentified flying object just hovering in Maricopa Valley, but it's a pyramid, it's perfect. No, it's got to rest upon a base. Faith's final resting place is on the Word of God. It's got to have solid foundation. If the foundation be destroyed, what's going to last? The principles that were built upon, the laws by which something is governed, whether we say the principles of vindication and the prophet, the, the, the very things that were built upon, the very things that uh, I've got us to where we are today in a positive sense. If the, the, the scripture here, the foundations be destroyed, and it's a lot that's being alluded to in this psalm. 
But it's saying if the foundations of good, what's good and right, the foundations of order and the law and justice is destroyed, what will last? This kingdom is built upon principles. This kingdom was built upon an order and, and the word of God and a certain attitude towards righteousness. If you get rid of that, it's lawless. It's chaos. Nothing will succeed. And what does it say? If the foundation be destroyed. And I express this to all of us. If you've got a good foundation, if you lose, lose that, what's gonna, how, how can you last? And if things are teetering and things are being shaken and you realize, man, I haven't been putting in the work. I don't have a foundation. Lay for yourself a foundation. A pattern of good works, the scripture says. This is, it becomes part of your foundation. Start doing things right now. Right now. Start doing things right, right now. There's are things that we can do. And I, I want to convey in a way that delivers a lot of grace to say, to not think, man, I've been married so many years. I've been raising my children so many years. I've been in the mess of so many years. And you look back and it's chaotic and it's not a good foundation. You've got mixed up in this. You got mixed up in that. You might feel where you are now. You're just completely starting all over. You don't have anything. It's charred ruins. It's like Brother Bradham says, it's all termite eaten, tore down. And, and God's not saying, yeah, it's all condemned. Just give up. He's saying, if I could put it this way, and, and I'm glad he's maybe not as cruel as we can be sometimes, but he'd say, well, I mean, what, what did you expect, Aaron? You weren't building where I told you to build. Yeah, you had a lot of good redwood. You had a lot of good paint, but you got to build on the foundation. And if you'll just build on this foundation, it'll come up right. And it's not too late to make sure our foundation is right. Brother Bram, even in his own ministry, come off the field, he's coming to the end of the year. He was going to quit preaching. He was going to go get his old job back. And he's like, I'm a failure. Told his family, I'm going to quit preaching. I'm going to go see my old boss. I want to get my the job I used to have back. I'm not going to preach anymore. And he laid in bed that night feeling like a failure. Like, yeah, I've blown it. The miracles, the signs and wonders. Here he is after all these years, almost 30 years of just dynamic Miracles and around the world so many times. And now he goes back to Jeffersonville, little house, a nobody, and he's going to quit. He lays in bed that night thinking about what the next year is going to hold. He's like, yeah, I'm going to be back just in the workforce. Felt like a failure. What was it all for? What did it all amount to? It's as if, as if it was all for naught. And God gives him a vision. Three different parts culminating in a cathedral-like tabernacle temple a vision we call maybe the tent vision it was going to be the crowning the culmination the climax of his ministry and nothing was wasted God promises he'll use all things and to think that some of your garbage and some of your mistakes and some of the things you've done you might feel like I've made a mess God looks at it and he says I can make that a jewel I can turn that into sapphire I can turn that into the, the, the amethyst. I can, change, I can change this into the diamonds and all the precious things that will actually form a foundation for the greatest that's to come. So we don't lose hope. There's one that's building alongside of us that knows exactly what he's doing. And I want to encourage you tonight. Let's lay a good foundation. Let's partner together with Jesus Christ who's made us a promise that he'll see us through to the end and take this work seriously. Can we do that together? I love you so much. You were so awesome to preach to. That's why I want to preach two hours. I want to enjoy this longer than just whatever it was, the hour and three minutes I just did. But God bless you. Let's rise together today.